Our final panel discussion of the day explores where else fusion technology might be used. So please, please give a warm welcome to our panel. Here in London, we have Nick Walkden, who is a senior consultant at Fraser Nash. Heather Lutis, who is Head of Innovation at UK Atomic Energy Authority, and Olamide Ongontoye, who is Policy Lead at the Tony Blair Institute. And joining us virtually from the US is David Edelman, who is Chief Policy and Global Affairs Officer at TAE Technologies. Over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invite to uh, be part of this panel session. Now, we're, we're the closing panel session of the day, so I'm going to start this off um, by asking a question that I'm sure all of you in the fusion field have been asked many times before. Have you ever played World of Warcraft? No? So Ian Chapman sums up fusion as a quest, and I think quest is the right word for fusion because it's, it's a long time in the future, and it's, all a, it, it's something that we're doing for the greater good, um, as well as the sort of personal gains and, and business gains we get along the way. But a feature of any quest, as anyone who's played World of Warcraft will know, are side quests. And I would, I would argue that most of the fun in a game like that is the side quests. And I would argue that a lot of the value in the quest for fusion is not in the ultimate goal, but it is in the value, uh, the innovations, the knowledge that gets generated along the way, and how they are used for the greater value and greater good of mankind, as well as the ultimate goal of, of, of achieving fusion energy. And what our panel session is here today to discuss are those side quests, those spin outs, those innovations, that knowledge that comes out of the journey of doing something that is first of a kind, is complex, has never been done before. And we're going to start uh, with um, a, a little um, interrogation of our panel uh, on just this. So we'll go around, and I'll give everyone a chance to, um, to speak in turn on this. Can you tell me your favorite side quest or spin out or innovation from Fusion that you know about um, that, that's, that's come to date? And we'll start remotely. We'll go to David first, um, if you'd like to give us your favorite side quest. Sure, thanks so much. And, and for those who aren't familiar with TAE, um, it, what it might take to get to these side quests is uh, first, a lot of time, and in some cases, a lot of money. So TAE was founded in 1998, raised over $1.2 billion. We've got 400 people around the world, including 200 in the UK. And I'm probably up on this panel because that journey has given rise to two spinoffs that are not just interesting technologies in the lab, but now actually entire companies in their own right, both of which came about because of our pursuit of fusion. Uh, now, the first is TAE Life Sciences. Um, this is a breakthrough therapeutic for hard to treat cancers of all things. And it turns out that the breakthrough that led to TLS was actually sitting right in front of us all along. Um, the, the neutral beams, which you should be able to see up or one too far, the neutral beams, there they are, uh, that are actually at the center of our fusion machine. They drive what's called the field reverse configuration. Our scientists got very, very good at controlling these beams and, and doing it with immense precision. And so it occurred to them one day, these things are basically mini particle accelerators and particle accelerators of, sort of different sort were being used for some experimental cancer treatments. And so if these systems were like those, but maybe if they were a pair of scissors, this was actually more like a scalpel. It was incredibly precise. And so when you have a cancerous tumor that's been tagged with a chemical marker, exposing it to this beam, it turns out, essentially allows you to dissolve them away. And with that precision, doing it with far fewer side effects than a lot of the conventional therapies in this space. And so right now, this company, spinoff of diffusion technology, is deep in clinical trials in several jurisdictions around the world. It's treating real patients, uh, and it's part of a commercialization story. Now, the second was also standing right in front of us, and that's power management, which doesn't sound very sexy as a phrase, <laughs> but actually is hugely applicable in this energy transition. And it was essentially invented for this reason. This is Norman. This is our fifth generation national lab scale machine in California where we do fusion experiments. And you'll see dotted all around this machine are these blue boxes. Those blue boxes are power storage and routing. And the reason we needed those is that you need immense power to turn this machine on. You need gigawatts just for milliseconds. You need gigawatts. And the grid would only give us a couple of megawatts. And so we had to invent a way to efficiently store power and then route it at lightning speed to a single space. And it turns out that same energy storage, control, and conversion capability is useful for fusion, but we need to turn on the fusion machine. It's actually really useful for other electric applications, regardless of the battery chemistry. So it can expand the range of electric vehicles. If you use this hardware and software suite by up to a third, sorry, about up to a third, 
It can make your EVs, electric vehicles, charge faster. It can, consumer batteries, same thing, up to four times faster. More efficient storage for conventional renewables. And so this itself is also a pretty new piece. This technology actually was invented just over the last several years. And we have now formed this as its own division within the company this year. Uh, now it's productizing, moving forward. And it has a pretty major chance to play a role, as you said in the intro, not just in the long term of a future that involves fusion producing electricity on the grid, but actually in the near term of the energy revolution and the energy transition that we're seeing taking place in the UK and the US and around the world. So these are two. I cheated. I picked two, not one. Uh, the, the, these are my favorite. And I think they will probably not be the last in our journey, which I bet we'll talk about more in this panel. Thanks, David. And over to Heather in the room. So I'm going to go with a, a much newer one. So uh, a company called Luffy AI. So they've spun out of UK AEA, um, and they're a company with a novel AI technology. Um, their idea allows them to modulate machine behavior, but in real time. So you don't need to crunch through millions of scenarios. Um, there are two people who are working, working at UK AEA on, in different parts of the company who, through what they'd learned and all their expertise, um, worked together and came up with this idea. Um, and now, this, this thing which was, it was just their idea, they have, they've put into practice. So they've gone beyond, beyond the idea, beyond the modeling, and they've used it um, in an injection molding plant. So it's there, it's in the company, um, and it's been shown to be more efficient than what they were currently using. It's reducing scrappage rates, and they're thinking about how else that this can be used in industry. So two people who had this great idea, which was supported by UKAEA, spun out, um, and is exactly what we should be doing more and more of. Fantastic, thank you. And Olamide. All right, thanks, Nick. So my favorite one is a company called Swiss212, and it's not necessarily a direct spin-out from Fusion, but has worked very closely and benefited from Fusion research. So Swiss212 is a technology company, which is Swiss, Switzerland-based, and um, they make um, signal transmission devices for satellite communication. And they started out as um, you know, a founder who was doing PhD research at EPFL back then on electromagnetic signal transmission. And he came up with a project which was quite interesting to an industrial partner that was interested in commercializing the project. Um, and things got very exciting. Um, it, you know, created a, the company called Sys212 today. Um, but there, there was a problem. And the problem was they needed to experiment and you know, um, get more knowledgeable on how to apply um, terahertz um, signal processing. And you know, terahertz signals, some of us might be aware of them. Um, back then, it wasn't so easy to transmit. I mean, you have the typical electromagnetic um, waves which you can transmit using you know, antennas and cables. And you have some of the other ones that you can use, you can transmit through optical fiber. Um, but terahertz is quite tricky. Um, so what they did was to connect with researchers, fusion technology researchers um, at EPFL, um, who were developing gyrotrons. So gyrotrons are used for heating up plasma to very extreme temperatures. Um, and through that collaboration, they developed the project to the point where it's now you know, very much commercially available. And Swiss to 12 today you know, is a multi-million dollar company. Um, last year, they raised about $20 million in Series B funding. Um, they've expanded their footprints beyond Switzerland. Now they're also in the US. And one of their products has already been launched into orbits. So that's really good. Um, and for me, what's interesting about it is not so much about the technology alone, but also the journey of the entrepreneurship and you know, experimentation. Because initially, they were looking looking at a market for you know, things like medical scanners and security scanners, but now they've pivoted into satellite communication. And that journey of just trying new things, experimenting and being entrepreneurial about it, um, sums up the story of Fusion and Fusion spin-outs. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the first, uh, the first Fusion technology in orbit. There we go, Fusion helping NASA this time. Um, so having just... Uh, heard some fantastic innovations that have come out of the fusion ecosystem. My next question for you is why? Why would we, knowing how difficult this quest is and how long this quest and this journey will take, why would we divert focus in our companies, in the public sector, our policy officials? Why would we divert focus from the core mission when it's so challenging? And uh, we'll go to David first on this one. Well, first of all, because we're geeks. I mean, we have it no other way. Give me a break. I mean, hard things aren't hard enough. We like these challenges. No, you know, in all honesty, I think there, there are a few reasons for it. First, you know, part of this journey of scientific exploration is, you know, as you've just heard, is figuring out what the inventions that you have can be useful for. You know, we in Fusion have been very, you know, helpfully benefited 
by advances in machine learning, by advances in uh, additive manufacturing, you know, ones that we've been pushing forward in, in, in the uh, electric transmission space. Um, but it's, it's really part of a, a team journey here. And we want to plug into that broader ecosystem. Um, second is it just be a shame to leave those things on the sidelines, right? If we have these ideas and we know they can be commercially valuable, uh, why not allow them to be spun off? Now, I think the fact that there's spin spinoffs is a pretty important point here. You know, it, at the initial phases, is there some cannibalization of the existing technical expertise in order to bring these technologies into a separate commercial domain? Yes. So we had to, for instance, divert some of the expertise that we had in uh, the early stages of indigenizing our, our neutral beams to the cancer treatment effort. However, that ultimately attracts more people onto itself. When you have an additional company, as we did, that is generating additional uh, revenue or investment onto itself, it actually helps build that momentum in a pretty important way. And I think the two other pieces you know, are, are, are going to come up a little bit later as we talk about it, but one is, you know, we need to keep making the case for why fusion is the next space race in a good way, for why fusion is actually going to benefit humanity, not just 10 years from now or eight years from now when we have fusion electrons on the grid, but right now. And these innovations, you know, I think capture that, you know, as you said, sort of NASA-like uh, impression that indeed this is pushing the boundaries of innovation in ways that can really benefit this green transition right now. And the last piece of it, which is just frankly very straightforward, is if you have technologies that can make a decent amount of money in the interim that don't sap in a meaningful way technological pace and progress toward fusion, that in turn can help fund the fusion development that you want to do. And companies or players in the space can be less dependent then on just going to seek more and more government funding, more grant funding, or even more venture funding and prove that there is a viable model of innovation towards fusion even before there is a viable model of fusion electricity generating revenues for us right now. Yeah, so it almost has a backward impact back in on fusion developers and, and development themselves. So we, we sort of already know that in the next few years, there's going to be a big scale up in, in any, any companies that are interested in fusion public programs. What will that scale up mean for these spin outs, this innovation ecosystem that's created, Heather? What will the the scale up of um, the supply chain in fusion mean for spin outs into the ecosystem? Well, well, the general sort of scale up of fusion. So, so we're going to see companies raising more money and um, doing bigger pieces of work and um, more suppliers entering the ecosystem. What, what might that? Yeah, so I think we're going to see the fact that we need to, we need to dig into more and more technologies. Um, so there's the, the sort of the core, the core part of fusion when we're looking at how we're containing or creating the plasma. But the more and more we look at what we need to commercialize fusion, what we need to think about in terms of the whole power plant, the more we're going to find technologies that have applications into other sectors. And I think once you get into that part of the power plant, you're probably going to see more, um, it'd be more common to see other applications as well, which then means you can put your technologies out there, mature them, make them more robust in those industries, and then selfishly bring them back into fusion when we need them. And do you see that as being, I mean, how do you see that, do you see that, do you see that ecosystem as being central to fusion? Do you see it as just being a sort of byproduct? So the whole um, innovation ecosystem is going to be absolutely essential to fusion. The international um, innovation ecosystem across sectors is, is going to be really crucial. So commercializing fusion is going to be really, really hard. And there are challenges which are unique to fusion. So any challenge which is not unique to fusion, where we can bring in technologies from other industries and work with other sectors, is going to be absolutely key. That's what's going to speed up us solving all these challenges. Um, and where we can make it easy on ourselves, we really should. Um, by working with, with other people. So that's, that's an interesting... Oh, sorry. I mean, just to add to that as well, I mean, if I kind of project into, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line when there's been so much more infusion of, you know, capital into fusion development, um, I would also imagine at that time you start to have a level of technology convergence around some key components um, and the level of an innovation and experimentation that you find today might be happening on a different scale. So it might not necessarily be about a specific technology, but rather it might be about the business model around it. So the suppliers, you know, start to have, you know, think about how, did I, how do I combine this way of making this particular technology, which is kind of becoming an industry standard with my existing business model, you know, what kind of licensing models should I uh, adopt? So, you know, the, the, the innovation kind of goes beyond just the hardcore, you know, the physics and, and the act hardcore technology beyond that into more of like, you know, the services and the business model around that. 
Brilliant. And we're going to have to get good at building these pieces at scale too. I mean, so when it comes, for instance, to the power management piece, the fact that we have this spin out business that is building these power management boxes, their first and biggest client is going to be the fusion company, Copernicus, which is the next generation device that, that we're building. They're going to have to figure out how to do what they did in a smaller scale right now for Norman up to Copernicus and then ultimately to a first of its kind fusion power plant. Um, that, like any other industrial process, manufacturing process, takes time, takes scale, got to drive costs down. And, you know, as, as you heard you know, from Heather, this is going to be an incredibly complex technological ecosystem. We're going to have to do that same thing at scale in probably 20 discrete technology areas. And so I think that's another area where, you know, we've got real alignment between these public programs that not only want to accelerate the pace of fusion, but accelerate the benefits that are coming back to domestic economies and to the global economy. The more we can get better at building these generally useful things, the more the public dime that's being spent in the space actually has a stronger case for it. And I think serves all interests. I was just going to say one thing that really helps us with this is the more and more people that are coming in to fusion from, um, from other sectors. So people coming into the fusion companies, coming into the public sector organizations, bringing in their experience from aerospace or oil and gas or um, the space sector, um, as well as working more and more with the supply chain who then have that experience from applying um, their particular expertise into those areas. So spotting those synergies is becoming, I think, easier and easier because there are people getting involved in fusion who have lived and breathed those other sectors. Yeah, brilliant. And let, let's stay on that topic of engagement a little bit more. And I mean, we've touched on it already. It's a, fusion is a reasonably new sector. Um, it's a complex sector. There's lots of new technologies. It can be quite hard to understand those synergies. What, how important is engagement um, with the public, with politicians, with uh, suppliers, with different companies? How important is that engagement uh, to increasing the rate at which that happens? Olami did. Yeah, um, that's an important question. And um, I mean, also highlights the importance of engagement. Um, I think of it as two things. So one, you want to engage people because um, it's just important from the point of education and you know, information and knowledge building. Um, a, a lot of the time, you know, people hear about fusion, but it'd be from a distance, and it's a bit, you know, the narrative is driven by media, and sometimes the information is a bit more on the hype side of things as opposed to actual, you know, facts and figures around the progress. Um, so you want to engage in a way that is pro proactive um, to educate people and just help them understand what's the level of progress right now, what's what's the new thing, you know, wh which areas have, you know, had the latest um, technological milestones. Um, it's only when you understand the progress and what's happening that, that you can kind of be aware of the possibilities. Um, but beyond education also, like um, Hida mentioned, it's important as well from the point of view of networking and bridge building. So different industries that potentially can benefit from fusion technology development. Um, you know, need, you need people who can understand what's the priorities in these other industries and understand the possibilities from fusion and so kind of serve as the link in between those two. Um, and that requires, you know, getting across to people from different industries, from the media to you know, policy to different other sectors. So yeah, from that education point of view and also from the kind of bridge building perspective as well, that's very important. I was going to say, we need to be really good at getting the fusion challenges out there. So telling people what we're doing and where we are, but also here are the things that we don't know how to solve yet and putting it out as a, as a question, as a challenge, which um, we've been doing with things like the, the fusion industry program, putting the challenges out there and not knowing what's going to come back because hopefully when people see these, they'll have their own spin on it and bring things that we never would have thought to even ask for as solutions to those problems. And um, so everything we've talked about really is, is all about almost open innovation. Um, David, my, I, a sort of interesting question from your perspective is how do companies who might have traditionally operated in stealth mode, um, which is not uncommon in fusion, um, start to approach these, uh, these questions about how to you know, build more benefit, build more value out of these um, spin-out opportunities? Right. I mean, and just for context here, I mean, TAE is a company that was in fusion, right, fusion stealth for probably 20 of its 25 years of existence. Right. Now, this was while there was primary focus on everything that was happening in the core fusion development, right? Taking that work from the physics lab and moving it into what would ultimately become the sort of proprietary field first configuration approach. But I think one of the key motivators actually to getting out, to being more public, to having a broader conversation was not just the greater proximity that we had towards fusion as a viable power source that people would start to see in their lives on a horizon that was cognizable. That was obviously important step one. 
But important step two was the opportunity that we had to demonstrate just what value this fusion research is having in other spaces as well. In other words, it was another motivator in being public, both about the fusion work, but also about these other sides as, as well, and being very explicit about that case. I mean, I think about, to, to the earlier question as well, you know, there is, there is essential public engagement and there is optional public engagement for a company like TAE or others. And essential public engagement is ensuring that there is broad public trust, public confidence about the safety and reliability and utility of the core technology. That's not optional. Some tech companies think it is, it's not. You have to do that. Engaging communities all the way up to the international level is absolutely core. And I think that's a refrain we've heard in the United States from the US DOE. We've certainly heard it from UK and, and others. But beyond that, there is a piece that I think far too few companies take the opportunity to engage in, and we're just beginning to do ourselves, which is talking about the other pieces, talking about the contribution that fusion and its spinoffs can have to energy justice, talking about the contribution that it can have to realizing a world where the state of California, in which we are based, has decided to ban internal combustion engines uh, in a de decade long horizon, right? So there are these big developments in which fusion can really be part of that dialogue and demonstrate what role it will be playing. And I think these spinoffs really help make really concrete, even for people that don't care about plasma physics, that aren't thinking about even the you know electric mix, but are thinking about, hey, I want to buy an electric car. I'm afraid it's not going to go far enough to visit my in-laws with the kids next winter. Well, this is the kind of set of innovations that can help bring that forward in the consumer space. You know, And for every one that can resonate with consumers, consumers there are 30 that can resonate with the broad business to business space. So I think that's a really important part and, and, and we're still figuring it out. How do we make that case on this kind of a timeline? Brilliant, thank you. And, uh, and uh, we, we will come to questions fairly soon. So get your thinking hats on online. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll come to them soon. But I, I just wanna to turn to yourself, Olamide, and ask a bit from a, more of a policy perspective, what sort of um, high level policy things could can be done to help maximize the, the spin-out potential, help find those really brilliant um, technical spin-outs that are gonna make a difference or, or you know, just help, help uh, increase that value generation? Yeah, very important question. And it's also one of the things we've thought quite deeply about at the Tony Blair Institute, where we are asking, you know, what can policymakers do to support fusion technology de development beyond clean energy? Um, and one of the proposals we've thought about was the idea of pivot support programs, which is just as simple as the name sounds. So it's, you know, a technology company that is trying to spin out um, from fusion um, um, research um, can, we would need some sort of support, um, whether it's, you know, um, acquiring talent in the target industry or it's applying for, you know, licenses or some kind of, you know, resources um, in the target industry. Um, and that's where policy can come in to say, you know, for the fact that you've made the effort to invest in this very high risk area of research, i.e. fusion, and you're taking the insight and innovation and IP you've developed into this potentially important area as well, uh, we're gonna be providing you with this you know, sort of amount of support. Um, and that can come in many different ways. It could be you know, grants, it could be um, just you know, some kind of um, rebates around uh, registration processes and things like that. Um, and beyond fusion, we see that type of model being applicable across a broader spectrum of climate tech um, solutions as well, like deep tech areas. So, you know, everything from um, direct air capture, which is still a kind of frontier, you know, deep tech um, climate space, climate tech um, space, to of course fusion as well. So, pivot support programs are things that you know countries like the UK and the US and others that have a growing cohort of frontier deep tech companies in, in fusion and area other areas should start to think a bit more broadly about and. Of course, it's still an idea in development, but you know, very important to start thinking about it. And, and Heather, as someone, oh, I was going to say, as someone at the coal face of delivering these uh, sort of policy, poor choice. Uh, poor choice of sorry, words. As, as someone <laughs> at the front line of delivering these uh, the policy um, interventions, what, what's your view on how to sort of maximise the uptake of these innovations? How, how do we keep them spinning out? Yeah, we we need a pipeline, right? We need to be able for people to go from having an idea to knowing what then, if it remains successful along the journey, they know what the next steps would be up until the point that they would then be, be spinning it out. Um, and we're quite lucky at the moment because there's quite a lot of momentum behind it. So you've got things like the um, Government Office of Tech Transfer, 
and programme set up in Bayes, which is looking at, from a public sector point of view, um, how you take all the things that are happening in public sector organisations and really make as much impact as you can out of them. And they're looking at all the things that they can do to support and that level from funding to, you know, um, uh, putting in place guidelines. And then you've got things like the um, UK I2S, so the UK Innovation Science Seed Fund, which is then looking at um, spin-outs that either have come from fusion or could be applied into fusion and looking at funding, equity funding that could be applied to them, as well as, you know, all the, all the potential um, investment out there from lots of, lots of different companies. But we really need to be able to show people that, um, well, things might fail and that has to be okay. We really need to get that through to people. If everything continues to be successful and we can support them in it, there really is a pipeline where they can see um, being able to, to go through and really um, make the most make the most impact out of um, their ideas. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So one of the most important recommendations here is ultimately going to be ensuring that these things don't exist in completely separate columns to each other. Right. So right now, the U.S. Department of Energy has a fusion public-private partnership proposal out that has a fair amount of money attached to it. There are other jurisdictions around the world that are doing that, too. But it's administered by the Department of Energy. Now, the Department of Energy may or may not have interest in several of the other you know, very diverse technology areas that you've heard out here. And so as we think about how we're funding fusion when the public dime is involved, Ultimately, the question is, is it serving the broad public interest? And I think there needs to be a broad conversation across governments about how to align those programs and even give credit within those programs. If a company is going to be pursuing with public funds fusion and they invent or discover something incredibly useful, as we've heard from all around, a lot of these are going to happen, then they shouldn't be incented to ignore it because the funding coming from the government tells them they only have to go towards X. And in fact, it should be quite the opposite giving the opportunity for them to use additional public funding to spin those pieces out, because there will be many more spin-offs like these. They will be commercially valuable, but ultimately it'll come down to, do the companies have the right incentives? And is government helping to spur the right incentives within the programs they're already a part of to help them make use of that? And I think that's a pretty binary choice for a lot of the administrations that are thinking about fusion right now. Brilliant, thank you very much. And uh, we'll end the my questioning session with, uh, as we started, and I'd like to go around the panel again, and, and you spoke about your favorite, most interesting spin out side quest innovation to date. I'd like to hear from you where you think there's great potential in the next couple of years. What would you most like to see spin out from the fusion quest in the, uh, in the next couple of decades? And we'll start this time with Olamide. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, for me, so, I mean, I like to think of myself as a young man, <laughs> um, you know, agile, can go 5K and, you know, not pants afterwards, hopefully. <laughs> um, but um, occasionally, I mean, especially in the last few months and years, I, you know, stare in the mirror and I see a strand of gray hair, it's popping out from somewhere off my chin and I'm like, what, am I growing older? <laughs> um, so the question of aging then comes to mind and aging is something, you know, some of us, of course, already know, has all of the challenges. Um, some, in some cases, it's, it's a case of limited mobility um, for elderly people. Um, so I'm interested to see how technology like Fusion can improve, you know, things like um, remote handling and robotics for elderly care. And that's already happening. You can see Fusion being used, um, robots being used um, in very complex operations to maintain um, Fusion reactors. And the development of robots in that application can then have an impact on robotics for elderly care as well. And of course, this is a country where you know aging is quite an important topic. So yeah, looking forward to that in the next 20 years. Absolutely. I mean, the gray hairs comment really cut <laughs> me deep there. And I mean, it's not just the sort of hardcore robotics, but control systems and things like that that you need in place for fusion have all sorts of applications in, in healthcare. Um, and, and Heather? I'm going to pick two. Um, so in fusion, we've had decades now of experience of, of working with hydrogen isotopes, storing it, um, capturing it, measuring it. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we can apply these technologies to the hydrogen economy. Mm. Um, what of what we've done is applicable, what, what we need to keep developing is applicable and how we can do that with people who are looking at um, the hydrogen economy more widely. Um, and then I think going back to that robotics thing, but going in a, in a, in a different direction, is looking at um, how the robotics that we've had to develop for fusion could be applied um, in a space context. Mm. So things like in-orbit manufacturing. You know, we have to develop robots which um, are very autonomous, can deal with harsh environments, um, and 
that's the same sort of things that you have to deal with in space, be it um, in orbit manufacturing, repair, capturing things that are floating around. Um, and it'd be really interesting to see what it is that could be applied into, into that context. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, robotics absolutely rife. For it. We already see it in um, fission decommissioning and things like that. And there's just so much potential. And uh, David, do you want to close us out with your, uh, your favorite spin out yet to come? Sure. Um, I think mine would be time travel. <laughs> no, I'm uh, what, I'm, what I'm most excited about is, is what we haven't invented yet. I mean, right, these, these, these two, all these others that we've heard, they came out of a form of thin air. I mean, they came at the kind of pursuit of the scientific edges that, you know, isn't all that common and is sort of the highest purpose to which we can put our own efforts. And so I, I, I don't presume to think that I am smart enough to know what five, ten years on we're going to invent and discover and then push into a new area. But what I do think is that I am incredibly heartened to see the proliferation of companies and researchers in the fusion space, the incredible public attention to it, particularly public policy attention in the last couple of years. And I think that combination, especially as we get more and more talented scientists into this field, get them excited about the potential. Um, I think it has potential to be transformational in huge, you know, in sectors far beyond those that you've just heard about today. And so uh, it, it really makes me as optimistic for the future beyond fusion energy as fusion energy does for the future of where we can go in this energy transition. So uh, a catch all answer, but it happens to be true. And I think it's a cause for, for deep optimism. Thank you, and time travel. Thank you very much. Um, so we're, we're now at the uh, Q&A portion of our uh, panel session. So if anyone in the audience, right, we'll start with uh, one question here and one question over here. If you could get the microphones, just whilst you're heading to there, we'll do, um, brilliant, one question. Okay, so um, I'm Bill Nuttall from the Open University. Thanks to the organizers for a great day and thanks for the panelists for a great panel which, uh, as I've been listening, has been you know, essentially about spin-outs. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking about going back to something that came up during the day about non-electrical commercial applications of fusion. We've heard about process heat, possibly applied to hydrogen, and I've personally been in that space. I'm a, I'm a non-electrical opportunities guy for fusion generally, and I've been there for about 15 years. And the thing I just sort of wanted to drop into debate was what I guess is the easiest and cheapest fusion, but which is so far from ever being anything to do with energy. And I'm talking about electrostatic confinement. I'm talking about fuses. And I'm talking about medical isotope production. Yeah, so, you know, there's various things that, you know, new, uh, fusion can produce. And if you're doing DT, you produce 14 MeV neutrons. Not many people want 14 MeV neutrons, but if you do, they're hard to get, right? They're so hard to get, you don't really worry about your electricity bill. So I'm thinking that one of the lowest hanging fruit is medical. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Comments on that. Comment, absolutely. Um, we'll take a, I'll do an online question, then we'll go to the question here. So online, um, we've got a question about space. And uh, the question is from Paige Donner. He says, if, if fusion is the new space race, as Mr. Edelman indicated, what about the potential for fusion propulsion for interplanetary exploration missions? For example, the Princeton satellite systems and other prototypes. Who would like to take interplanetary propulsion? <laughs> Heather. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And it's really exciting. Um, and it's, you know, you're joining up to two really exciting areas of, of research, exciting areas of engineering. So there are, there are people looking at this now, um, looking at it maybe in a long term context in terms of fusion, but also thinking about um, nuclear propulsion in general. And then a lot of the research that we're looking at in terms of materials, in terms of protection, then would feed, would feed into that. Um, so, for example, there are, there are plenty of people, um, people like reaction engines who are on site at Cullum, um, thinking about how they apply their technologies and how if, if it had a nuclear component, what, what is it that we, that we do, that we know, that could then be applied to those, those technologies. So I think fusion propulsion is a, is a little way off, um, but uh, it's definitely something people are thinking about already. Yeah, and um, I just point to uh, a report that well came out a couple of years ago. was updated recently from the Fusion Industry Association, which talks about um, different markets for fusion uh, that private fusion companies are trying to enter into. And space propulsion is is a, a common um, second market that fusion energy companies are interested in. Um, so I think we had a question over here in in the room. If we can get a microphone down to here, thank you. Hey all, uh, Shad Garrity. 
I won't mention what state I'm from, but from the United States, and we're a pension plan, and we've actually made quite a few investments in the fusion space. Uh, my question regards all the comments regarding um, the spin-outs. How do you maintain a balance between spin-outs, continuing progress without deterring investors who, you know, failure does happen, but we'd prefer that to be minimal? Who, uh, who wants to take this one? Uh, David, do you want to take this one if you're... Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, it, it's a great question, and it's one that you know we, we get from our board and we get from investors all the time. You know, the short answer is, look, our North Star is, continues to be, and will always be, getting clean, the cleanest possible fusion energy on the grid as quickly as possible, period. In, in our case, in an aneutronic way. That is where we are spending our time and our energy. Um, I think what we have found, though, is that as we build this field, and as we have more and more technical expertise, I mean, we've grown considerably. We've added you know, hundreds of people over the last couple of years. Um, there has been the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time. And it turns out when you have something like the power management division of the business, for instance, that's a technology that um, once you have it invented, you'll continue to iterate it. But a lot of the work that goes into it next is not anything core physics. It's engineering and engineering alignment with potential customers, right? Taking a power management technology invented for a fusion device and then turning it into something that can be modularized onto an electric vehicle, building the commercial relationships with large, you know, with car companies that can actually implement it, and then getting that out at scale in manufacturing. Those are three very different uh, uh, skill sets, three very different sets of employees um, that frankly are not presently in some cases as much a part of what we're doing in Fusion. So I think the idea is, yes, find that initial idea, make sure that it has the resources to grow, and there will be some inherent near-term cannibalization. But most importantly, make sure you're building the expertise to productize this thing very quickly. And I think we found as both of these two spin-offs have gotten off the ground, it has actually created uh, not just a, a lack of cannibalization of the two, but greater focus and mission for everyone who's working on these technologies more broadly. So it's actually been synergistic as opposed to uh, a sort of uh, a zero sum. And, and we, we heard a bit earlier as well about how, how the value of a, a different revenue stream can be so important for these uh, companies as well, particularly, I guess, when you're about to scale up, uh, he says, as someone with no experience in a startup. And I mean, just to add very quickly to that, also, I mean, the idea of supporting spin out is not necessarily a, about, you know, deflating the enthusiasm and the momentum around, you know, fusion technology, but rather it's about being opportunistic in a good way uh, to say, you know, you've developed this cool stuff and it has a potential application in this, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. How can we maximize the value of that? Um, so it's about mitigating commercial risk. Um, so, you know, from the, from the pension fund perspective, um, but as, at the same time, trying to maximize um, the impact of technology development. I just going to add that you know spin out is one way to to really um, make impact from these fusion technologies, but it's not the only way. Um, working in collaboration with organisations who are already in that space, so that they can draw on that expertise. So it's not so much of a, a draw maybe on on your sort of uh, core fusion. Um, programs is another way of doing it um, and sometimes it will just be disseminating it right telling everybody all about it so that then you can make progress in other fields and it's going to be it's going to completely depend on what what it is what the potential is and then what's the best way to, to take it to take it forward and particularly coming at it from a sort of a public sector point of view looking at that that impact in terms of what is the best way to make make the most out of these things spin outs could be one but it could be could be lots of other things. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, as someone who's recently become a, a supplier, that fusion problems are hard, right? I think most, most suppliers who try and tackle a fusion problem find that they are difficult problems to tackle. But in doing so, you normally come up with ways that help you in other problems, other parts of your business, efficiencies that you know, drive wider um, benefits of units. And I think that's a really important way that, that impact from fusion goes far beyond fusion. Um, we'll go to an online question and then we'll come back in the room. So the online question is uh, from Simon Keynes. Much of uh, fusion spin-off comes from universities involved in academic studies that underlie uh, that fusion research. Is there some kind of international startup support network to facilitate technology transfer to other areas? Um, so uh, I'll first turn to um, Olamide, but we'll take um, responses from anyone in the room about maybe international startup support networks generally support for startups that want to do this. I mean, yeah, 
that's an important question. Right now, I see you know the fusion startup landscape. It's growing, and that's good news. Um, but at this point, it's not you know like you have a million of them at this point. Um, it's a kind of tight knit community, and of course, you have all kinds of international collaboration between you know, startups in the U.S. and UK EAE, UK AEA, and you know vice versa. Um, but I feel like. If you belong to that ecosystem, you kind of tend to know people um, and what they're doing um, on the other side. Um, but as the space gets bigger and expands, then it's going to be more and more important to have those kinds of international um, networks that do you know, really interesting things for knowledge transfer. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was just going to say, and, and it's making those connections, right? So between people who've got an idea and people who might then want to fund it, I guess events such as this, other big fusion events, where people can, can join, join those different ways of looking at it together and see if there's a, there's a way forward. And of course, the Fusion Cluster. We're, we're here today because of a support network that's in place to bring startups and suppliers and fusion companies all together. Um, any uh, more questions in the room? Question back there. <laughs> Hi, Ella Ashdown from the Nuclear Industry Association, even though I know two of you already. <laughs> um, so all this talk of robots and fusion-fueled space exploration brings to mind science fiction, which I don't feel has been mentioned enough today. So my question is kind of a chicken and egg question. What came first? Do you think science fiction inspires science, technology, and innovation? Or do you think science, technology, and innovation is the reason that we have science fiction? And how important do you think creativity in the arts and literature and film and TV inspires scientific innovation in fusion and, and further afield as well? Thanks. Yeah, great question. Who'd like to kick us off? Uh, so I guess I, I would say creativity generally, I think, is something which we should... Um, we should talk more about as being something that is necessary in scientific and engineering subjects in order to make those leaps, which is, is going to solve problems um, across everything that we, we do. Um, in terms of whether um, science fiction or science fact, what, you know, what drives the other, um, I, guess, I guess it's a bit, of, a bit of both. However people find their inspiration, whether it's seeing something that's somebody has, has come up with an idea that someone has come up with that then inspires a story or somebody um, imagining something and then people imagining how it could be physically done. Um, I guess it's a, it's a nice, nice cycle um, uh, of both those things working together. And I think, uh, David, after quoting Time Travel as your favourite <laughs> spin out, you have to have the last word on this one. Uh oh. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I will say this. First of all, not all fusion solutions require uh, radiation-hardened robots. Uh, a neutronic fusion doesn't, so I guess we're going to flush those robots down the toilet in our place. <laughs> um, it's a fascinating question. It's a fabulous one. Um, I would just add this. It, I, in my six years at the White House, the most interesting meeting I ever convened was one where we brought in 15 of the top science fiction writers in the country to tell us about what they thought was coming down the line, not in five years, but 10 or 20. And so I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, but my hope, my wish for the public policymakers in the audience, those that might want to go there, is that they actually read more science fiction, both for the dystopian part, which is, I think, very important to visualizing what could go wrong, but also in figuring out how to think about the interconnections between these various technologies. And the reason why you have some of this ideation and, and we're not in this space, but between you know, fusion and space propulsion, and fusion and beyond, is, is because of that kind of creative thinking at the edges of technology, engineering, and human aspiration. And so this is uh, not, 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 nothing but a plug for broad, the broad value of doing that kind of visualizing. Because the truth is, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, I think most people, including in the scientific space, would have regarded the future of fusion energy as science fiction for the foreseeable future. And now everyone from the White House to the companies represented here today have concluded that fusion energy is more likely than not in many cases to be on the grid in a rounded decadal timeline. That is science fiction becoming science reality. And we don't have very long to get used to what it might take to make that happen. And so I hope people are reading the books and spending time in all of these areas of innovation, of which fusion is really just one. 
Thank you very much, and what an uh, inspirational way to end. So thank you very much to my panel, um, Heather, Olamide, David, and uh, thank you to the organizers for having us today.